I was blindfolded by two gangbangers in the parking lot of my hotel in the LA. They frisked me up and down, and then they stuffed me into the back seat of their car, and we drove for seemed like forever, all in silence. And then we stopped, and the doors opened, and as I was getting ready to get out, someone whispered in my ear, whatever you do, do not look in their eyes. And as they continued to lead me downstairs, still blindfolded, I couldn't wait to look at their eyes. And then as I was centered amidst this crowded basement, they took it off and I'm blinking my eyes and I see on my right, this guy with a cluster of black teardrops under his eyes. Then as I look to my left, I see another guy with even more black teardrops tattooed under his eyes, a sign of how many people they had killed. So I start looking down, and that's when I saw all the guns. Everyone was strapped, and it was time for me to speak, but I better not stutter. You see, I was born and raised in 1954, the year of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, that Thurgood Marshall won, that allowed an opportunity to recognize that unequal schools was unconstitutional. And I had, in this great land of opportunity, I'm at the bottom rung of the ladder. My father is black from Alabama. My mom is Puerto Rican, a place where that has never been recognized equally in America. My parents were able to buy a home in the very first integrated school district in Flint. I went to Scott Elementary School, and my father had bought a home in front of a church, which had this big parking lot that allowed us to play year round. These are the things in my childhood that gave me an opportunity to believe anything was possible, learning the fun of play. And I did everything I could in my high school to do what my parents said. Through education, I could accomplish anything. And I played football, and I wrestled, and I was better than average. But my senior year, when I had earned a full scholarship academically to the University of Michigan, my idol, the head coach of Michigan, Bo Schimbeckler, came up to my high school, talked to me personally, and said to me, do me a favor. If you decide to come to the University of Michigan, don't come out for my football team because you're just not good enough. Wow. He's no longer my idol. When I went home and told my father what Bo Schimpler said, he said, forget Bo. I'll get an extra job, and I'll pay extra for you to go to Dartmouth College. And that proved him to be a hero, a person that raised me in an adage of learn from others, the mistakes of others, because you won't live long enough to make them all yourself. But once I got to Dartmouth, my freshman head coach, instead of telling me I wasn't good enough, he told me I could be the very best player in Dartmouth College history. And what story are you going to choose to believe? I believe in Jerry Byrne. I believe in Dartmouth College. I got the greatest education you could believe. And I performed on the football field, becoming a consensus all-American and believe that I had achieved something. And then all of a sudden, I'm invited to the Hula Bowl, an all-star game, my first and only time on TV, when the defensive coordinator, George Hill from Ohio State, told me I wasn't good enough. He made jokes about me every day in practice. Before the game, he insulted me, comparing me to the surf boys on the West Coast. And in that game, my only televised game, only played one play. And my confidence was destroyed. And on the ride home from Hawaii back to Flint, I had a layover in Cleveland. And I'm laying there really feeling sorry for myself, really considering quitting football. I'm teary-eyed. And who comes down the aisle? Muhammad Ali 
my hero. And as Muhammad Ali came down, I wiped away my tears and I ran up to him and talked to him because he was the person that inspired me. And then all of a sudden, I realized that I needed inspiration. And he told me, after I told him I was thinking about quitting football, that I needed to be fearless, that everyone needs to believe in themselves, and that's how we become heroes, by believing in ourselves. And I then took my opportunity to be drafted by the Bengals and started my rookie year, and the sole goal in the NFL is to win a world championship. And in the 50 plus years of the Cincinnati Bengals, they have only had two Super Bowls, and I, as a defensive player, played in both of them. And so for me, when I first made the team, the very first thing I did was volunteer at the Cincinnati Speech and Hearing Center. And the second thing I did was do the best to win Super Bowl 16. In order to get in there, we had to play the coldest game in NFL history, 59 degrees below zero. We won that game, and then we're in Super Bowl 16 in Pontiac. And for the first and only time in Super Bowl history, there are two players who played with each other in high school are now playing against each other in the Super Bowl. Ricky Patton was their starting running back, and one of us would go home with a ring, and it was him. It took seven more years to get to Super Bowl 23, and we're playing the same team, the San Francisco 49ers. And by this time, all of my community service work has resulted in me being an NFL Man of the Year, but now I'm the only player who is also on Cincinnati City Council. And when we were there in Miami for Super Bowl week, there was a riot in Overtown. And all of a sudden, my city council duties were needed. But the night before the game, unfortunately, Stanley Wilson decided to redo drugs, and he was lost to us. He was our best running back. And the very next day, against the 49ers, I played the best game of my career, giving everything that we could have to ensure that we could win. We were 3-3 at halftime. I led the team in tackles. I had a strike, stack. But on the last five plays of the game, I'm on the sideline because our defensive coordinator called a prevent defense, which was the only defense we had that put me on the sideline. We lost the game by four points in the final 30-some seconds. And so now I've got to realize that the promise I had made all my career to the Cincinnati Bengal fans that we would win a Super Bowl was not going to come true. I'm now retired, and I retired from Cincinnati City Council and then took a position as general manager of the New York, New Jersey Knights, which allowed me to perhaps do well enough to come back to Cincinnati to win a Super Bowl in a different way. But after two years, the NFL pulled the plug on the World League of American Football, and I'm out of a job for about an hour. And that's when Jim Steig came to me and said he had a problem that was as big as my nightmare. My nightmare at that time was instead of being on the sideline, for those five plays, I was on the field, and I made the big play. And my team saw that we had won the game, and they were cheering, and the hugs were so real, and the confetti was coming down everywhere. And it was such a thrill to be so happy, to win something that you promised your fans forever that they would get. And then you wake up. It's a nightmare. And that's how I ended up being unblindfolded in front of the blood and the Crips. I had taken a job under Jim Steig, who was the head of NFL Special Events and the Super Bowl, to help the NFL solve a problem. Just months earlier, there was the Rodney King riots. This Super Bowl was in Pasadena, and the halftime act was Michael Jackson. And that NFL asked me to perform one of their very first social justice efforts. And my goal was to provide for those kids in that neighborhood 
a safe neighborhood. The first place I went to was the Watts Willowbrook neighborhood, and they had no hot water, they had no technology, no, con no computers. The gym floor was like this. There's no way those kids were gonna get a great education or were they gonna have fun playing. And the first person that told about NFL Youth Education Town was Garth Brooks. And Garth Brooks said he would fund it. And he actually came to the press conference in South Central. And when this place opened, it provided a great opportunity for kids, the ones who were the most at risk, who had nothing the best that all of the other kids in the world had. And also, at this time, that's where I met Michael Eisner at the team headquarters, and that's where he asked me, what would you do with all the land we had at Walt Disney World if we were going to do sports? And I told him what I had just did with NFL Youth Education Town, but at Walt Disney World, you could do it better. You're inviting kids from all the world. Kids who have never before went to Walt Disney World were now going to a very special place because of sports and the importance of play in their lives. And so it came to be that one of the very first events that I ever secured was a relationship with the Republic of South Africa that I had so much respect for Nelson Mandela that I even supported on Cincinnati City Council that our pension board divest itself with doing anything in South Africa. And that was one of the things that contributed to him getting out of incarceration. Within those 27 years, Nelson Mandela, who felt that sports could change the world, every day for 27 years, he closed with Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the felt touch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet, the minutes of the year finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul.